maximum. Um, the gradients are perpendicular to the contour levels. Now the contours are the points of equal height. So if something is perpendicular to the points of equal height, that means that something is the direction of the greatest ascent. Or if you go in the other direction, it would be the direction of greatest ascent. That's why the gradient algorithms that follow the gradient are also called steepest ascent or steepest descent. And the same algorithm that you use to go up is the same algorithm that you use to go down. You just need to change the direction of travel. And so we saw that the gradient is the vector of derivatives. Uh, most of the functions that we deal with have many uh, free parameters, many free variables. And so we need to compute the, der the derivative with respect to each of the parameters that we want to learn. So we end up with a vector, which is uh, all the derivatives. You can skip having vectors and you can skip having matrices if you want to keep, treat each term one by one. But then your code will be very messy and, and involve many for loops. And your math will also be messy uh, with many sums and so on. So th that's why it's important to always try to use abstraction and introduce matrices and vectors. But so we learned that the basic idea then is if you start anywhere, learning is just in a maximum likelihood sense, sense will be just a process of going down an error function to the minimum. Okay. And then we also, um, so the general algorithm is if you want to descend, the gradient points in the direction of the greatest ascent. So if you go in the negative direction, so that's why there is a minus here because we're going in the opposite direction of the gradient. So we're at the location, uh, maybe a different color. white. So we are at the location theta k and if you want to go down we follow the gradient at each point in order to get to theta k plus 1. Okay. And by following the gradient is we go in the opposite direction of the gradient because the gradient points to the maximum so if we go in the opposite direction we're going toward the minimum. And if we have a quadratic function, we will get to the minimum, provided we have the right step size. And so I mentioned to you that um, if your step size is just a number, a constant, then if it's too small, you might just get stuck going down. It's the same as, think of the step size as how much strength you're putting on to go down. So you, you might be snowboarding and you might pick the, the place that is the steep, how many people here snowboard, by the way? Because I'm wondering if this is, or not many, so. <laughs> hmm. Ski? <laughs> Guess you get up and play. <laughs> um, I'll skip the snowboarding analogies. Okay. It, it, determines how fast you're going down. Um, okay, and then we looked at an example, the linear model. So doing gradient descent in the linear model is just a process of moving from one line um, to um, moving from one line to another line. So you start with a particular slope on the point and then you keep updating that slope until it fits until it goes through the point. Okay. On the last slide, um, maybe this is clear to everybody else, it's like f of theta and theta 1. Mm -hmm. That's the surface, right? And then the gradient is um, like the partial of that, is that right? Um, yeah. No, no, the next one, next one. <laughs> Wait, which one? This one. Oh, yeah. So in this case, there's two parameters. It's 2D. So there's theta naught and theta 1. The function yeah. is, is it that surface? The function is the surface, is yes. The surface. Okay, and then the yeah. gradient is the That's um, correct. Red line. So in particular, this function here um, is a quadratic. So this particular function could be 
um, something like it could be something like what you have when you do least squares which is y minus x theta transpose y minus x theta which is basically the sum of squared errors and so so essentially the, the idea is the is, instead of trying to solve one particular problem like let's do spam classification or let's classify DNA microarrays and so on rather we're going to abstract and what and, and this will be useful because we will learn a recipe that will allow us to solve any problem that if we encounter, provided that it's a regression or classification problem. And the abstraction is we always write the likelihood, we differentiate, we take the log, if we negate the log we get an error function, okay, because remember the Gaussian for example, um, e to the minus that will essentially give you a multivariate Gaussian which is the likelihood for linear regression. So if, if we have a probability, a likelihood, and we take the log and we negate, we get an error function. Some people even skip this likelihood step. Some people go straight to the error function. If you write an error function, you differentiate it, equate to zero, you, you get the, uh, an expression. Um, sometimes you can solve for theta, that's in the linear model. Most of the time you can't solve for theta, so if you, especially if you have multiple modes and so on, uh, it will be very hard for you to solve to get an exact equation for theta. Linear regression is one of those very rare cases where you can solve for theta. Most of the things we do in practice um, are not things that you can do by hand. So this is not the, the, the sort of calculus world and linear algebra world where you could do things by hand, that goes away. Instead you need to learn to um, do math with computers, basically. Compute, um, uh, understand these ideas of optimization on how to actually come up with solutions using computers. And so what, as soon as we have a cost function or the negative log likelihood, we just differentiate it and we get the gradient. And then that immediately gives us an algorithm. The algorithm is the new theta is the old theta minus a step size in the direction of the gradient. So provided that you have an expression for the gradient, provided you're able to, given an F, that, that's actually the bit that takes effort. Because for a particular problem, you're going to have to come up with a good F, an F that makes sense. But once you have the objective function, equivalently the likelihood, because if you have the objective function, like if I have an error function, um, some sort of objective, actually let's call it f, but if I have some objective function, f of theta, then I can just take e to the minus f of theta and that essentially gives me um, a likelihood. Right, because this guy goes down, like in a quadratic, this guy would be a Gaussian. So there is this nice sort of, um, this is basically the same thing. The cost function is just the negative log likelihood. The reason why we prefer to use likelihoods instead of just error functions is because when you have likelihoods, then you can also see how you could add the priors to it. And if you have probabilities and you want to build bigger models, then we know the rules on how to assemble components, conditioning and marginalization. So if we're in this framework, it, we, it, this framework basically gives us a good way of us constructing large models. But some folks like to just work with error functions. And these error functions are called error functions. They're called cost functions as well. Um, you're trying to minimize an error or a cost. And even some people call these energies. You're trying to minimize an energy. Because actually there is a link in 540 I go over this. In 540 I, I show the connections between entropy and energy and computation and information and neural networks and all that. So we actually do all these reductions. So they're all connected. Um, and and so, in a sense, what, when you're trying to learn, what you're trying to do is find the minimum energy configuration. 
So you could think of in your brain, you're trying to find a stable, a set where your neurons stop go crazy, but they're all happy and stable with each other. Um, and that's essentially a memory. That's how you s store your memories. Um, now, uh, at least one way. Um, so, and that's a general recipe. You have a, once you have this F, you're done. There's one more step, which is you need to know how to compute derivatives. The truth is you don't even need that step. I mean, I'm teaching you that step because I want you guys to learn a bit of calculus and, and it might be useful. But right now, we have tools for automatic differentiation that compute derivatives automatically. So most software out there, you just need to know this function f of theta. Provided that you give the algorithm f of theta, everything else will be done for you. The thinking will be in coming up with f of theta. There is a particular form of, there's a particular package called Theano. Um, it's a package, a Python package for machine learning. I don't think there is a Windows version. That's why I usually don't use it in this course, because many of you are in Windows. Um, but that package has automatic differentiation. So if you give a function like f of theta, um, the package will symbolically get you the derivative, the gradient. So you don't even need to worry about um, how to compute the gradient. Um, we won't be using automatic differentiation, so we're going to do the exercise of uh, getting the gradient. And but once we have the gradient as a function, we can just call uh, this gradient descent algorithm. In other words, just keep looping over the gradient and we'll get to the middle. That's all it takes. And now if you want to go, and now if you don't want to deal with the issue of sorting the learning rate by hand, then you use the Hessian and as the learning rate. And the Hessian is nice because it's also going to give you a very fast algorithm. It's going to be way faster than gradient descent. Like for, for this problem, linear regression, it could take you millions of steps to get to the bottom if you're following the gradient. Mainly because it becomes very slow at the bottom. But if you're using Newton's method, as I hope you all went over the exercise I gave you, the last exercise I gave you in class on Wednesday, um, how many steps do you need to take in order to get to the bottom with Newton's method? One? One or two? How many people think one step? Two people. Three people. Two steps. Okay. I'm not going to give you the solution. I'm going to make you work. I'm going to make you work on it in a bit. Um, but that, that's gradient to set. And for the linear model, it, it's kind of brute force to do gradient descent because we can actually solve exactly. Okay? But nonetheless, if I teach you how to do it for the linear model, it will be obvious how you could do it for the nonlinear model. The only difference with nonlinear models is you're going to have multiple minima. So you, know, you might not converge to the lowest of them all. Many machine learning problems actually don't have this, but the, the techniques we're going to be using next week, which is neural networks, and the week after, which is random forest, two of the most popular techniques for, and certainly the, the techniques that are ahead in the game of object recognition and so on right now, they do rely on finding good local minima. And so we talk about the global minimum as the best minimum. And we talk about local minima as any minima. And so the game is really to find any minima that's a good, uh, you know, that's a good minimum. We'll never hope to get to the global one, because that's NP hard. But fortunately, in the, the, these techniques are always applied to data. And if you use data, um, you know, for practical applications, many of the minima are, are good enough solutions. And we essentially rely on that. I had several questions. I missed one here. Oh, it was about Newton method. So Newton method is no Let, let me come back to Newton's method in a second. I'm actually going to revise it. So what heuristic is used to determine if a local minimum is reasonable given a problem set? What technique would you use? You, you've estimated a model, a neural network, say. You found a local minimum. Now you want to... Um, I, I randomly sample for a while, like randomly sample a bunch of local minima and then 
you pick the bunch. Limiting theorem. Now, which one is the best? You have ten local minima, ten, ten set, ten, ten values of your parameters. You have a training set and you have a test set. Yeah. You cross validation. Exactly. You cross validate. You pick whatever model gives you better predictions. Okay, before coming to Newton's method, the gradient descent for the linear model is fairly easy. Uh, here we have a linear model, so what we do is we compute the gradient. And you can either go this way, or you can differentiate this guy. And it basically gives you the same expression. Because this would be i equal 1 to n, this will be xi transpose and then you get yi minus xi um, theta and then you get a minus one because it's times minus xi. Okay, so and once you have an expression for the gradient then the algorithm is just theta, the new theta is the old theta by going in the opposite direction of the gradient by an amount eta, which you can choose to be 0 0.2 or 0 0.8 or 1, um, and then times the gradient. In this case, this becomes a plus. Is this a okay. And if you define the x size as transposes, or no, that's fine. In the top summation, are you missing it too? Like in the bottom, you can put it to eta. In the bottom, in the uh, theta k plus 1 equals theta k plus eta, you can put the 2 in there. But in the top one, don't you need a 2 there? Uh, so the, the graph. So I, I don't the graph, follow in you. The second line, the gradient f of uh, theta is equal to 2 x transpose, blah, 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 is equal to the sum of uh, i equals 1 to n of x transpose. Is there not a factor of 2 in there? Oh yes, there could be a factor of two. I, I, mean, I, 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 I took it inside. Yeah, you can uh, the reason is because um, eta or eight is a constant, so two times a constant is still a constant. So I, I usually don't bother with the constants. Since you're choosing eta, it doesn't matter because you can always half eta. So. Why is the theta missing from the um Red equation, second from the bottom. The second from the bottom. Your gradient. Um, if it's missing, it's because I probably made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it's missing. Um, yes, indeed, you're right. Yeah, because essentially I'm just copying the gradient, the exact expression of the gradient, and I'm plugging it there. That would be theta k. Because you use your current. That is correct. That's important. So is the gradient evaluated at theta k? Uh, yeah. You asked us to show you how many steps it would take. So would we? Like apply this equation. Oh, I asked you to, to ask you. I asked you about Newton's method. How many steps it could take? This one, we've actually agreed that it all depends on the value of eta. If eta is zero, then of course it will take you. It will never converge. If, if eta is zero, one times ten to the minus sixty, it probably eventually, when the gradient becomes tiny, um, underflow will kick in and you will actually never converge either because of underflow. Um, if it is very large, like 210, <coughs> what's going to happen is it's going to oscillate because you're going too fast and so you just go up and down, up and down and you actually never converge. In general, to find out how many steps it would take, I mean you wouldn't do it here because it's too many, but for the uh, example where one or two. Or you, you might take an infinite amount of steps and still not converge. That's the <coughs> point. Unless you have the, the right eta, you may not converge at all with this algorithm. And so there are some guidelines on how to choose eta in order to ensure convergence. Um, I'm going to come back to it 
at the, after the going over Newton's method, I'm going to touch on the issue of how to get convergence for gradients. But the gradient algorithm may not converge unless you have the right eta. Newton's method, on the other hand, will converge. But in pro and, and this essentially is the picture that illustrates it. In this case, there's only one minimum, so you should get there. Um, but if your eta is too small on the left-hand side, your step sizes are too tiny. For those who snowboard, it's like you might be on the steepest double black diamond, uh, whatever slope, but if you're just like stopping yourself with your board, you're not going to go down. Okay, so if your eta is too small, you won't go down. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you eat as too far, as too large, then you're going to just basically be swinging wildly. And again, convergence will be impaired as a result. Um, for the uh, case where eat is too small, like you, if we, just, if we disregard the fact we're using a real computer, like SPSS, and we just use the real computer, then how does the convergence work? No, and in fact, uh, yes. What do you mean by a real computer? Di a digital computer? Like, I mean, um, that laptop that you have in front of you? Yeah, or so your like iPhone? Can, like, that the number when it's really small, it won't be zero. Like, it won't be. When the number is very small, it will become zero. Because your computer has a lowest. Yeah, that's why I said it's <laughs> Yeah. And so the problem is that number gets multiplied by the gradient. And now, when you're near the minimum, when you're in this region near the minimum, the gradient becomes almost flat. Mm -hmm. So that is the, the problem, that you're multiplying a number that's almost zero by a tiny number. And so the whole thing is going to be very small. When you multiply two very small numbers, you get something that's very small. And in fact, below numerical precision, you'll get precisely zero, right. even though you haven't reached the minimum. No, you should not disregard the, uh, the, the limitations of your computer. In fact, like the naive base example in your homework, you cannot disregard uh, the limitations of a computer. Because if you do, you will not get the right answer. So it's important to know that how computers uh, compute and the issues with small numbers. Um, even without, even if you do this in log space to deal with, um, I, I saw you. Um, even if you do this in log space to deal with small numbers, it's still the case that if your step size is too small, you're going very slowly. If your step size is too large, you start oscillating. So there is a sweet spot, obviously, that would give you the right convergence. Um, it typically is one thing that in the theory, we know that if we make it 1 over n, um, we can get it to converge. So there is theory to get us to converge. Um, but uh, instead of going into, you know, in practice, if you pick a small number 0.1 and it went and you saw that it was too slow and you changed the number, you will very soon come up with a way of getting a good alpha. So it takes you a couple of tries running simulations. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be smarter about it, you do this thing that I'm not covering that I call line search which I'll leave it to you to read about. Let me take him first. Um, it's not obvious to me that even if we had infinite numerical precision that this would still converge. Like it's actually, pretty, I, I think it's quite likely that it That is correct. There are cases where it doesn't converge even if we had infinite precision. That, that, that is correct. Precision per se. That is correct. Shouldn't it be a function of the gradient? I mean, if the gradient becomes too small, you increase your step size? Yeah, you can come up with a rule like that. So there are rules like that, momentum rules and so on, taking into consideration the grade. Okay. There's many. So welcome to the field of optimization. Books have been written on how to set that step size. If you take the optimization course in fourth year, you will learn all about how to step that step size. We're going to move on because for now, but be aware that there's these things called line search and so on that will make your, uh, will set this eta automatically for you. We're not going to cover that in this course. 
what we will cover is one method that sets it automatically for you that instead of having eta, so remember the gradient descent, this is Newton's algorithm and contrast it with gradient descent. Gradient descent says theta k plus 1 is equal to theta k minus eta g k, where g k is the gradient. So gradient descent uses just that eta or steepest descent uses just that eta. Newton's method replaces eta by a whole matrix. This matrix essentially tells you how fast you should go in each of the theta directions. Your theta, you have a multivariate function. So if you're in 2D, it's telling you how fast to go in the x direction, how fast to go in the perpendicular direction, in the y direction. So, so in, in a sense, Newton's method is the solution to all your questions on how to set um, theta. The catch, however, that I want you to be aware of is that the Hessian requires now that you go and compute the second derivatives. So it's more work. Moreover, it requires that you store this matrix and that you invert this matrix. Inverting a matrix is one of the most expensive steps that computers have to deal with. To a large extent, the progress in science has depended on a, uh, on a number called, you know, on a on a polynomial, n cube. n cube is what it costs you to invert the matrix. n cube is what it costs you to solve a linear system. n cube is what it solves, what it costs you to compute eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. All these problems have this fundamental bottleneck, n cube. Um, and when n is 20,000 genes or 2 million uh, n grams for like Wikipedia say titles, um, inverting a 2 million by 2 million matrix is not an easy task. Your computers can um, very easily be, you know, stop doing what you expect them to do. That is, you pay a lot in computation. Um, however, for small problems, Newton's method is the right method because it converges very fast. Um, you don't need to choose the alpha, so you have this matrix H. And then I mentioned that you could also think of Newton's method as a quadratic approximation to a cost function. So there is a cost function f. So let's assume that we have an f that looks like this. This is my f of theta. And what Newton's method does is it fits a quadratic to f. We call it f quad. It will fit it at the point theta k. And then what you do is you find the minimum of the quadratic. Now we know how to find the minimum of a quadratic. Okay, because a quadratic is just uh, has only one minimum and essentially the whole of these squares, well, everything we've been done in this course is finding the minimum of a quadratic. So what we do is we differentiate the quadratic, we equate to zero and that gives us that equation which is the equation of the minimum. So it's saying the optimal theta, if you saw here, it's saying the optimal theta is theta k minus h minus 1 gk. So the optimal theta which will be theta k plus 1 is this guy here. So. And that's how we get the next theta. And so what we do next, we fit again a quadratic, let me use a different color. We fit a quadratic at the next theta. And the way we fit this quadratic with the Taylor series uh, expansion is we essentially, the Taylor series, by matching the first and second derivative of the Taylor expansion, we're just saying that at this point, locally, the slope and the curvature of both the green and the blue curve, or the red and the blue curve here, is, are the same. Okay, so we're just making them sort of tangential there. 
And then we do the same thing again. We, fo we follow the direction to the minimum here, and that's theta k plus 2. And then we keep repeating this process. So we're always fitting this ball, find a minimum. Fit the ball, find a minimum. But of course, this is just for you to understand. We don't code it like this. However, this, I, I, this thinking is useful for designing other algorithms. And there's many uh, people in optimization that use this notion of upper bound minimization to come up with good sort of scalable parallel algorithms um, to deal with big data. Um, and if, but here it's quickly we see that the Newton's algorithm comes from just minimizing this quadratic upper bound. And the main advantage is we get rid of uh, beta. Instead of having to choose eta by hand, we just need a matrix of second derivatives, H, and then we're done. Now, let me ask you again. If now my error function is quadratic, which is the case of linear regression, how many steps do you think Newton method needs in order to find a minimum? One. One. So once you understand the method, it's, it becomes obvious because your error function is this. This is theta k. You fit a quadratic. Oh, but what happens when you fit a quadratic to a quadratic? If you know how to fit a quadratic to a quadratic, you'll get the same quadratic. And so the next step is the minimum. Okay, so with Newton method, one step should give it to the minimum. Let's check our math. Let's make sure that our math agrees with our intuition. That was the exercise I left for you last time. I wrote down the expression of the gradient. I wrote the expression for the second derivative. And now the only thing that was left to do was to cancel the two with the two and then multiply these terms. So I would get the first term, which is theta k minus x transpose x <coughs> minus 1. And now I'm going to multiply that common factor times the two terms inside the square bracket. And this is just equal to something that should be very familiar now. Right? Because x transpose x inverse times x transpose x is just the identity. This times this is the identity. And then you just have theta k minus theta k, which is 0. So this cancels with what's left here. And then you're just left with x transpose x. That shouldn't be a surprise, because we know that the solution of least squares is x transpose x inverse times x transpose y. So we've just shown in math what the intuition tells us, that in one step we can get to the minimum. Okay, that's basically how we do Newton's method. There's the pseudocode. Um, I can, I will let you do look at the pseudocode at home. I will, in fact, for your second, for your last homework, you get to implement it. Um, instead, um, I'm going to tell you about one more algorithm. When you do, when you do, um, say linear regression. Um, I told you that the optimal way of choosing uh, the new theta, sorry, let me backtrack, not the optimal way, but the gradient descent way of computing theta is to go in the opposite direction of the gradient. And then you had this expression sum from i equal 1 to n. In fact, this becomes positive. 
So I'm basically going back to this expression here. I'm just, I'm going to rewrite the expression of the gradient for linear regression. And then there's the two there, but let's assume the two has been subsumed inside the eat. Okay, so that's our um, expression for the gradient. When we have n data points, okay, this is what we call batch learning. We take the whole batch of data and we update the grade. There is a different way of doing online of doing gradients called the online way. In the online way, your theta k plus one will be equal to theta k plus eta x k transpose. Oh, and this is evaluated at the previous step. In other words, every time you get a one data point, you do the gradient with one data point. Okay. It's called stochastic gradient, and stochastic is basically a word for, um, I was going to say aleatoric, a probabilistic. Um, because it, it, to stochastic in the sense that there's uncertainty. You've only seen one data point, you don't know what other data points you're going to see, so there is uncertainty. Um, because you haven't seen the whole data. Um, but you just see one data point and you update the gradient. Why is this useful? If you're learning a li linear regression from tweets, if you're trying to take the words of a tweet and you're trying to predict a poll, then, you know, like, I don't know, the Gallup polls or whatever, and, and that you can do actually reasonably well, or you're trying to predict the price of a stock from tweets, so what you do is you, you take that input vector x, which is basically the sort of all your one if the word is present, zero if it's not. It's a very large vector, so your theta will be very large, 10,000 dimensional or so. And, and then you're just trying to predict, I don't know, what the stock value will be the next day. Um, at each day, you get one, one update. You get one, one x. So you get a set of, or a set of, actually, at each, not each day, each tweet, you get one update. So as soon as you get a tweet, you get a new prediction. And, and because tweets keep coming at us and never stop, you're always learning. Okay. And in fact, because you're always learning, you will also adapt. Because if the statistics of the problem change, your theta will also change. So theta might never converge to a particular theta but the theta might just be always tracking the solution. Um, now, under some conditions, so what we can also do, if we do have a batch of data, so one reason is stream, what we call streaming machine learning, streaming pro problems like Twitter, where the data is always coming at you. Or if you're doing environmental monitoring, it's the same situation. The data arrives at you every day, and you need to update your model and you cannot assume that you could collect all the data because there is no computer on earth that will allow you to collect all the data. You essentially, you have to learn and then throw away the data and you only keep theta. Our brain is like that. We don't store everything we see because um, that would be problematic. Um, probably go crazy or something. There's actually some recorded disorders that have to do with that. Some people have this sort of perfect memory um, for some periods and then because of that they can't memorize any new things. So every morning is a new morning. Just like the movie Groundhog Day or whatever. Um, the other application where this is useful is even if you have an amount of data that you can load into memory, sometimes it's useful to actually process the data one at a time. So you go from one to n 
and then you go back to the beginning and you go from 1 to n again. Or you keep randomizing the data. So you do several passes over the data. And that's very common in the training of neural networks. And you might want to do that simply because uh, and what you're trading off there is computation, passes over the data, versus forming all the matrices that you need to form in order to compute the batch gradient. So it's often you're trading off computation and storage. That depends on the resources that you have. Okay, so you have those two. And then there is something in between, what's called the mini batch approach, which is super popular in machine learning. And if you probably read the neuro latest neural network papers, um, you'll, you'll hear about people doing this. So theta k plus 1 is theta k plus uh, eta, and then you have a sum, and then you go, I don't know, from j equal 1 to 20, x, j, transpose, y, j, minus x, j, theta, k. So, so in other words, you collect 20 tweets, and then you do an update. So every 20 tweets, you update your parameters. And then how big should your mini batch be? That's another uh, parameter that one optimizes. There, are autom there exist automatic ways of choosing all, um, these parameters. Uh, that's uh, a, a lot of us here at UBC do research on that, and we have techniques called Bayesian optimization and so on. Bobak is there writing a PhD on the topic, and we teach that in 540. But for now, you would just say pick a small number, and you'll see how fast your algorithm is doing, and you would cross-validate in order to get that number right. OK, so these are probably the most important ideas toward actually getting, uh, getting you to actually learn uh, with you know, complex models. Neural networks use exactly the same working. The only thing that's going to change is the error function. But it's always going to be the same thing. We compute the derivative of the gradient. We compute the derivative, we have the gradient. And then we have these three choices. We either do batches, or online, or mini batches. And this is what happens when you do, uh, so this is the, the error function here. And this will be theta 2, uh, theta 1. And so what's happening is that when you do online learning, you don't go straight because you only see one data point. So you don't go straight to the bottom. And in fact, sometimes your error gets worse. Sometimes you go back up. That's not necessarily a, good, a bad thing. And in fact, when we get to neural networks, we'll see that often it's actually good to go back. Because sometimes you find a suboptimal solution. But if you go back, that gives you the chance to jump over it and try something else. And everything I've said is sort of written here, and it will be available to you. OK. So we still have time, so I'm going to introduce logistic regression. So I've shown you how to apply gradients and Newton's method to uh, linear models. Now I'm going to tell you how to do that for a neural network with one neuron, only one neuron. Imagine there's this creature with one neuron. A creature with one neuron is quite powerful, by the way, in, the, in what it can do. And we're going to use a very idealized model of a neuron. Um, it's essentially what uh, neuroscience called the McCulloch Pitts model of a neuron. And this guy there is either McCulloch or Pitts or not sure about the cat. But the <laughs> idea is we use this sort of caricature of a pyramidal neuron um, from your cortex. Um, and the neuron has synapses, sorry, it has dendrites. The dendrites make a synapse, which is a connection, it's an electrochemical connection with other neurons. Um, your, their electro, neurons communicate by electrochemical pulses. 
and there's spikes. And if, in fact, it's the rate of spikes that determines uh, whether the message gets propagated or not. There is substances, chemicals between those connections that determine how fast the current propagates. When you take drugs, you destroy, you unbalance those connections, and that's why you have crazy hallucinations and so on. And you're tampering with something very delicate, by the way, when you do that. Um, and when you transmit a signal, it goes through, say, an axon. They can be a meter long, I think longer even. And then the next neuron picks it up, and so on. And usually it's slow. The brain is a very slow computer, but it's massively parallel. Um, and it computes in a different way. It doesn't compute the way uh, our laptops do. So a model of this, uh, the, the McCulloch-Pitts model, is as follows. You take all the inputs, x1 to xd, and then I set one input to a 1, just like linear regression, so I can have a bias. That gives me, and then that sum just means you take a weighted combination. So theta naught times 1 plus theta 1 times xi1 all the way to theta d times xid. And that's basically in vector notation, just the vector xi times the vector theta. And then that vector, so if we were doing linear regression, we would be done. But now we're going to do one more thing. We're going to put that linear regression output through an activation function, which is like an S. Looks like an S. It's called a sigmoid function because it looks like an S. And what the sigmoid, the, the shape of the sigmoid function is basically the expression is given by that. And the shape is that green curve. It always asymptotes at 1 and at 0. And the output, essentially, of evaluating that sigmoid is uh, what I call pi. It will always be between 0 and 1. So we will be able to interpret pi as a probability. So these neurons, they're firing probabilities. We're using um, this, the rate of firing is essentially pi. It tells us uh, how active, whether the neuron sends a message or not. Now, because you have a sigmoid with, which is kind of like a gate, it's a smooth gate, if you're way to the left, your neuron doesn't fire. So your input, which is xi times theta, has to go beyond a certain threshold for the neuron to fire, for the neuron to become active. Okay, so they will be off, but when they recognize, when they see an x that combined with the thetas makes them, gives a very high x times theta, they will fire. So given an x, and that x could be the picture of a cat or the picture of a dog, if the neuron has the right thetas, it will be able to tell what there'll be a neuron for a dog and a neuron for a cat and so on. And that's how we'll be able to do recognition. That's a sigmoid function. Again, a bit in more detail. So the input is xi times theta, the output of linear regression. And then you just pass it through the sigmoid function to get the S. Now, the sigmoid function, if we evaluate it when the input is 0, we would just get 1 over, whoops, if we evaluate it when the input is 0, we get 1 over 1 plus e to the minus 0 e to the 0 is just 1, so we get a half. So we're going to interpret the output of a sigmoid as the, as the, output, as the likelihood, as the probability of y given x theta. So we have linear regression, and now we're going to pass it through this function, and we're going to be interested in predicting whether y is on or off. We're now changing the model so that we can do classification, binary classification, like is it spam or is it not spam? When the input is zero, we get a half. In other words, when xi theta is zero, the sigmoid, which, is the, which I will define as the probability of y equal one, given xi and theta, will be a half. And so, 
when the probability is a half, so then the pictures kind of tell you the whole story. When the probability is a half, above a half, I'm going to classify a data point as being cancer, say. Below a half, I'm going to classify it as being non-cancer, as the patient being healthy. Each point here, blue and red, think of it as a patient. And there's two features about the patient that we're measuring. So you could think of x1 is height, x2 is weight. And if I put all my pe or every person there by height and weight, what I might be trying to classify males from females, then the curve, the probability curve is the sigmoid in 2D. When the height of the sigmoid is a half, the intersection of that with the you know, horizontal plane is just a line. And that makes sense because that's the line xi times theta equals zero. And that's the line that I'm showing you there. So, of course, this is looking beautiful because I happen to have the right sigmoid. I happen to have the right theta. So this is a sigmoid. 